Okay, let's talk conference finals, both series. Uh, Celtics-Pacers is tonight, and so if something crazy happens and I just have to react to game one, then okay, but otherwise I'm going to wait until Wolves-Mavs game one to talk Celtics-Pacers game one. But yeah, I love these conference finals because as a neutral NBA fan, I think Mavs-Wolves should be great. And as a Celtics fan, while I will try to make the case for how Indiana can stretch the series out, obviously my Celtics are the favorites. Anyway, Mavs-Wolves, two great defenses with stars that can go off. I'm sure by now you know that they did not have any matchups after the trade deadline, so after the Mavs got PJ and Gafford. Although I did still take some things from their January 7th matchup that may or may not matter, and we'll get to that as we get to it. Some quick injury things. Number one, Luka's knee. We will see. It felt like he was looking a little better at the tail end of the OKC series. And then as far as Maxi Kleba, don't know if he's going to play. Of course, if he does, then he can give the Mavericks a little more spacing, which could potentially throw something weird at Gobert because you know Rudy's just going to want to protect the rim all day. But we'll see. We don't know if he's going to play. But first off, just let's talk this Dallas team going at this uh, great Wolves defense. Matchup-wise, I'm going to guess you're seeing a lot of Jaden or Ant on Luka or Kyrie. And then Nikhil as well when he comes in the game uh, for either one of those guys. That's what it was in the January 7th matchup. I mean, you saw more of Ant on Kyrie and Jaden on Luka if that's what you want, but you saw both as the game went on. But if it ends up being more Jaden on Luka, which would be my initial guess, of course I could be wrong there, then that's interesting because Jaden, I mean, he's taller than Luka and he's got a big wingspan, of course, and his screen navigation is great and the whole thing. So I imagine as far as like being able to pressure Luka, get around screens, contest his shots, he'd do a good job. But... Luka outweighs Jaden by a, a decent amount. I mean, Jaden's listed at 195. Luka's listed at 230. Of course, those are not going to be 100% accurate. Point being is if Luka's just got to lean on, you know, backing him down a little more or just the physical drives that Luka does that lead to his floaters or his kickouts to PJ or Derek Jones or Kyrie or the, the lob to Lively, whatever, you know. If he's got to go to those more against Jaden, then okay. Um, of course, we will see how Luka's knee is doing. Now, if you want it to be more ant, I mean, he's shorter than Luka, but he's closer in weight to Luca than Jaden is and uh, because Ant is a I mean he's 22 years old he's a great athlete it seems like the dude never gets tired like I don't think that it would be a problem for him to take on more reps on Luca while still doing everything on offense for the Wolves so we'll see what it ends up being between the, the two of those as far as Kyrie I mean look obviously Kyrie is shifty as hell and we saw in the Thunder series that uh the Thunder were just throwing a lot of bodies at Kyrie and he was making the right play consistently and the thing with the Wolves, and this will lead into like pick and roll coverages with Gobert and Cat in a second here, but like the thing with the Wolves is they are not as aggressive with bringing help out of the corners the way that OKC was. I mean, for the season, the Wolves, they gave up eight corner three attempts per game, which was towards the bottom of the league, obviously by design. That's been a common thing with Rudy Gobert teams, because when you have Rudy, you have the luxury of not having to rotate as hard because he's going to clean it all up in the middle. Now, it got a little weird in the Nuggets series because Gobert had to help off of Gordon, you know, that old spiel. With this series... While it is possible that we could see the Wolves try, like, Gobert helping off of Derek Jones or helping off of PJ or helping off of Josh Green, like, that, I don't think that's off the table. My bet would be it's a little more typical Gobert guarding Lively, Gobert guarding Gafford, and then it becomes more of a game of how high is he on screens. Like, in the January 7th matchup, Kyrie's first two screen actions, Gobert is in a typical drop. One time Kyrie makes a pull-up two, other time he makes a pull-up three. After that point, Gobert was higher up on those screens, Against Luka, he was at the level of the screen. Cat was, like, hedging and recovering on Luka. He even switched on Luka sometimes. Now, in that game, January 7th, Cat was guarding Derek Jones. And sometimes Derek Jones was able to get open in the middle of the floor off of, like, him screening for Luka and then Cat being high up on those screens. And that's going to be a question for the series, too. And the thing, to go back to the whole corner threes thing, it's like, yeah, for the regular season, the Wolves didn't allow as many corner threes because typically most teams don't have Luka Doncic and Kyrie Irving, but these guys do. So that might force you to be in more rotation than you're really comfortable with, which could amp up those corner three-point attempts. Then it becomes a little more of, did PJ make the shots that he was given? And obviously in the Thunder series, he mostly did. And funny enough, as I say that, uh, in that regular season matchup, one of the big threes in the fourth quarter was a Kyrie three off of Gobert going high up on a Luka screen, and then Jaden had to rotate over, and then it's Kyrie getting a three. But this is also going to come to, you know, Kyrie is going to get some amount of shots versus Gobert on these screen actions when he's got Lively or Gafford screening for him. Similar thing with Luka. And just what does that whole thing look like? Is it Luka making floaters over Gobert all day? Is it Luka, you know, pulling Gobert out because you like, you, you dribble into the screen and then you kind of like dribble out to force the switch. Gobert has held up great on, you know, switches in the Sun series. But also how often is it going to be Gobert blocking one of them, Gobert making them hesitate, Gobert making them make a desperate pass out like it's, you know, the push and pull of this whole thing. Great rim protector versus great offensive players. 
And I do think, again, like if Cat is consistently up on Luca screen actions, I wonder if Dallas would lean into that a lot. Like maybe he's on PJ and you have PJ screen for Luca all day or for screen for Kyrie all day. It's anything to get the Wolves defense in rotation, you know. But of course, like Gobert is just going to plant himself in front of the rim if you're having Cat, you know, high up on a screen. To go to the other side. So fun thing about the January 7th matchup, the first minute of the game, the Mavs got weird with the rotations or the matchups, excuse me. They had Derek Jones on Gobert and they had... Dwight Powell for that game. Obviously, Dwight Powell's not going to play in the series, but for that game, he was the center. Uh, he was on cat. They did it for one minute, and then after that, they just went to typical put Dwight Powell on Gobert. Then they had Luka guarding cat, which is interesting. We already saw Dallas in the last series mess with the matchups by having Lively or Gafford, whether it was playing off of like Giddy or Wiggins or a little bit of Lou Dort or even like zoning up a little bit and then having like PJ on Chet most of the time to make those screens switchable. I did that whole spiel during that whole series. Similar to the possibility of the Wolves kind of making the matchups weird with Gobert, I'm not taking it off the table for OKC to try this against the Wolves as well, with the idea being like, if we have to put a wing on Gobert, we can switch those actions, and we are going to bet that Gobert doesn't make a whole bunch of turnaround jumpers with the shot clock going off to where we, he's not going to kill us on those. But hell, the Nuggets tried that in that game seven, and Gobert was like consistently drawing fouls off the ball and stuff by like sealing smaller dudes. So there's that. But my guess is going to be more typical, you know, Gafford or Lively on Gobert, all that. As far as Cat, I mean, if, if a big body's on him, whether it's Luka, whether it's PJ, I mean, I would guess that it's going to be PJ because he can be physical guarding Cat, and then also he can switch any sort of Cat screen. Uh, and I would, I mean, my guess is that Luka's going to be on Jaden. But if Luka ends up on Cat, which again, he was in that regular season matchup. I think Luka and Dallas can deal with that better than maybe a Luka defense pessimist would believe. Like, I mean, I, I think it's been a whole team effort with Dallas defensively. I don't think it's just been a couple guys. But anyway, as far as Cat specifically, I mean, yeah, we'll see. If PJ's on him, similar to how it was with Aaron Gordon, sometimes you're just going to have to get some physical post-ups on PJ Washington or potentially Luka, you know? I mean, it did feel like whenever the Wolves were able to get Cat switched on to, let's say, Jamal Murray in the last series, it felt like there was a lot of success there so they could try something like that with Kyrie and of course if Cat ever wants to go nuts from three the Wolves will take that really my question with Dallas is just when are they bringing the doubles on Ant because I'm just kind of assuming that they're going to not to say that it's like game one has begun here come the double teams like I don't think we're going to go that crazy and I would assume that they're going to put somebody on Cat that would allow them to switch any sort of uh, Ant screen action but yeah that's my biggest thing because we saw in the OKC series Dallas's ability to pack the paint and then still close out enough to where OKC, like, yeah, they shot a good amount of threes in the series, but they didn't get wide open, clean looks all day. I mean, they were they were really, really good at that. The rim protection was good. The rotations were good. All of it was good. And with this Wolves team, I mean, listen, round one against Phoenix, not as good of a defensive team as Dallas, obviously. Dant figured out the double teams beautifully. Against Denver, there was the game where the double teams really, really affected the Wolves' offense, and it was a little rough. Eventually, they spread the floor out. They put Rudy in the dunker spot. They had a number of plays where it's just the double comes, a bunch of swing passes, and it's Conley for an open three, or, you know, Ant is splitting the double, and then he's hitting Jaden for a corner three. Like, it's what feels like a lot of the same conversation a lot of the time with the Wolves' offense and how it's going to look in these playoffs here. But Dallas is a great defense. Now, if the doubles do not end up happening, then don't listen to me. Now, from the jump, I would guess that we will see uh, Gafford and Lively higher up on Ant Gobert screens. And then as far as Conley, like, Teams have mostly just wanted to drop back on Conley because they just say, listen, we're not going to put our defense in heavy rotation for Conley. But, like, Conley just, he's going to do the right thing every time. Like, he's willing to take the pull up. He will make the skip if it's open. And it's a similar thing with Cat, where, uh, I mean, teams have been quick to double him. You know, Phoenix threw two at him sometimes. The Nuggets tried it out sometimes. When Gordon was on him, they were a little more just like, let's play him straight up. But, you know, he ended up with switches. And, I mean, hell, like, in that first half, him getting switched into smaller guys kept the Wolves in the game before they went on the insane comeback. But also, like, if P.J. Washington is guarding Cat in a one-on-one, -on -one, like, yeah, P.J.'s a strong dude. I don't think the Cat's going to be able to just back him down all day. Now, a couple more things for the Wolves. Uh, one is just everything Nas read. Mavs got to be ready for Nas on the offensive glass, ready for him spacing the floor out when there's two to the ball on Ant, if there's going to be two to the ball on Ant like that. Uh, you got to be ready for, like, the catch and drives that are definitely going to be there from him. Also with Jaden, I mean, let's not forget, the dude just had two straight 20-point games against the Nuggets. Just catch and shoots, transition, or flow of the game, you know, attack off the catch. Like, Jaden doesn't do it every game, but he's not one of the dudes that you can just kind of forget about in the corner all the time. As I say that, again, PJ he went nuts versus the Thunder in a number of those games. I think Luka and Kyrie have both fit in very well to the Mavs' great defense. Like, I think it's it's a whole team effort with them. Also, I wouldn't be surprised if Kyrie and Luka try to get Mike Conley switches. Anyway, what's my prediction? So, I think I've mostly stayed away from the crosshairs of Dallas Mavericks internet. Because it's kind of a passionate group, let's put it like that. And that's because I either keep picking them to win or 
it's because they don't know I exist, which is very possible. But I am going to jump off the bandwagon for this one. I cannot pick against this Wolves team a third time. But look, I can see the rationalization for picking Dallas. Luke is the best player in the series, although Ant, I mean, you know, he's had a number of insane playoff games at this point. And also, again, we're going to have to see how Luka's knee is doing. This Dallas team could be equipped offensively to put this Wolves defense in rotation more than they would like to. And also, uh, you know, at times the Wolves don't handle the doubles on offense the best. But like, the mental toughness, the size, the defense, the rebounding, also the whole like beating the Denver Nuggets thing that just happened, you know, that matters. I got to go with the Wolves. I'll, I'll take him in it's six or seven. I don't know. Also, I've said nothing about Mike Conley. He just continues to be solid across the board. Love the dude. Similar to Nikola Jokic. I love Mike Conley. Okay, let's go to the Celtics and the Pacers. Again, this kind of serves as like my game one video, if you will, for the series, if you're still watching. But again, if something insane happens, I'll react to game one. Or the game already happened, depending on when you're seeing this. Um, so I think the last thing I saw was Porzingis might play game three. Cool. The number one thing for the Celtics is be prepared to play the Pacers, as basic as that sounds, which means just get back all the time, off of makes, off of misses. It wouldn't shock me if the Pacers won one game in the series just off of the Celtics not being great in transition defense. And then we've already seen with one game with the Heat, one game with the Cavs, that the Celtics would lose if uh, the opposing team just goes scorched earth from three and if the Celtics are like a little soft with guarding on the perimeter or just having a couple of miscommunications here and there. So like that's the pathway for the Pacers getting this to six games. And so that could mean, you know, a game where Halliburton is just got a lot of daylight coming around screen actions. And for what it's worth, I mean, if Horford's going to be dropping on screens, if, if he's guarding Turner, I mean, the Celtics have tinkered with the, like Horford on like Isaac Okoro in the previous series. So we'll see there. But like if Horford, if, who's ever he's guarding in the first couple of games before maybe Brzingis comes back, like he's probably going to be dropping back on these actions. Like if he switches on to Halliburton, then okay. But like there's there might be opportunity for Halliburton to get those. Now obviously Derek White's going to be guarding Halliburton. Well, not obviously, but that's my guess because looking at the regular season matchup, uh, Drew spent most of his time, at least in the last game they played, on uh, Siakam. And I'll talk more about that one in a second. But like, okay, let's say if Halliburton's got daylight on those or if he's able to go at Horford if it switches or maybe the Celtics' uh, miscommunications on like some Siakam-Halliburton screen actions or... Miles Turner gets a whole bunch of pop threes off of screens or whatever. Like, that's how the Pacers get this to, like, a game six and, and all that. And TJ pushing at every opportunity he has, and maybe the Celtics don't play more aggressive coverages on McConnell, so he's flowing into more, like, pull-up twos and all that when the bench lineups come in. Perhaps there's a game where Neesmith just puts it all on the line to guard Tatum, because I'm kind of guessing that Neesmith is going to be guarding Tatum, and he's trying to be as physical as he can be, and, you know, you try to figure out how physical can I be before the refs call it and that whole thing, like... I mean, let's not get a mistake, and the Celtics are heavily favored in the series. I'm just trying to, like, paint the picture of how the Pacers could stretch the series out a bit, you know? I mean, as far as, like, the drew Siaka matchup, if it ends up being that a lot, I mean, look, Drew is great at guarding guys bigger than him, and it's the whole center of gravity thing where if Siakam tries to post him up, it's, well, Drew, yeah, he's shorter, but he's strong, and he can put all of his weight into just trying to hold his spot in the post, right? But if Siakam can get clean looks over him, then, yeah, it's going to be a little tougher for Drew to just contest at the apex of the release. So we'll see there. It wouldn't shock me to see, like, Jalen guarding Siakam sometimes. Uh, I mean, Siakam was guarding Jalen for the most part in their regular season matchup, and so that's cool. Uh, in the regular season matchup, they also tried... Again, I'm, I'm just going off of the last one. Obviously, they played a bunch of times against each other this regular season, but um, you also saw sometimes where Przingis was on Siakam, and that one's interesting because, like, I don't think Siakam, or I don't think Przingis is going to do as good of a job at, like, pressuring Siakam on the perimeter as Drew could or being as physical in the post. But as far as, like, contesting any sort of pull-up two that Siaka might go to, or, I mean, waiting for him at the rim, obviously, like, Przingis can do that very well on Siaka. But again, we'll see if Przingis plays, uh, or how many games he plays, and that. And of course, you know, if Przingis or if Horford ever ends up on Siaka, then that means you're going to have a wing, or potentially even a guard, if you want to get real wild, on Miles Turner. And, uh, I mean, the Celtics, you know, with their switching and all that, like, Missoula's willing to get very adventurous defensively, and, uh, and yeah, look, I, I didn't even super lean into, like, Tatum or Jalen, just scoring and doing all that like the biggest thing with the Celtics for me is just like don't forget that the possession ends when there's 10 seconds on the shot clock I'm stealing that one from Zach Lowe it's like the perfect way to capture what happens sometimes with the Celtics offense where like if the initial screen action does not work they just kind of go idle for a second they go what do we do next you know um, and just make sure Derek White's always involved whether it's him getting a screen from a big whether it's him screening for Tatum or Jalen whether it's one of them screening for him like just Derek White involved all the time to where, like, you know, he can pop off of these actions and then catch and go or shoot the three or then, you know, you force a switch, throw it back to Tatum or Jalen, whatever. That's the biggest thing. I imagine the Celtics are going to try to put Halliburton in as many actions as possible. He did a pretty good job at dealing with some of those in the uh, 
Nick series, you know, hedge and recover the whole thing as it went on. They got they did better. Again, the Celtics should win the series. My pick is going to be Celtics in five games, with the caveat of it wouldn't shock me if Indiana took this to a game six, just off the back of like they're just such a unique team with the way they push the ball and how spaced out they are and with the Celtics occasional lapses and like just being way better than their opponent is in these playoffs it wouldn't shock me if it happened twice to the spacer team but I think it's going to be Celtics in five 